Oh, oh. Kerry Obert, at the end of our last podcast chat, which was on top tongue tips for boosting high frequency energy, we were pondering the sensory parts of the tongue. And I was then kind of sent away, inspired to see if I could train myself into liking coffee. Now, two years on, Kerry, I'm sure you're absolutely dying to find out how I've got on with that. Yes, that's, I, it's been on, on my mind the whole two years. That's so, so did that work? Well, the big reveal is I have no idea because I've done absolutely nothing about it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So really what we can learn is don't ask me to be part of your research projects because I won't do it, evidently. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Compliance <laughs> is certainly an issue. We deal with this with speech pathology all the time. You know, we, we sort of say that changes that happen in the therapy room disappear on the way to the parking lot. And a lot of that has to do with compliance and home practice. And, and some of it also has to do, I think, with how much people understand or take away from the session. You think they understand. You think they get it. And they go home and they don't. And so they're, you know, they're, they're always compliance issues. I've just had my knee replaced. And a lot of times I get home from physical therapy and I have totally forgotten what they've asked me to do. So anyway, I get it. <laughs> I mean, is there a way that us teachers can make sure the student leaves our studio with, with a little bit more solidity with what we've done? That's a great question. And I think one of the keys in speech pathology that we've learned is the idea of teaching back. It's a concept where we, at the end of every session, we ask the, the client, or in my case, singing students or, or speech pathology clients, to teach back what they think they understood from the session and to teach back to me the exercises that they need to do when they go home this week. Mm -hmm. And it really is revealing because you realize how inadequate perhaps your teaching was and how unclear you may have been. And a lot of times we like to put that on the student when actually it's our own lack of clarity, lack of, you know, clear directives. And so one of the other things that I think is really important is writing down what you want them to do and really being specific about how you'd like for them to practice. So it might be practice your scales for five minutes or practice, you know, your song for this long, focusing on these things, whatever. So I, I think it's just really important to be really clear about what you'd like for them to do, writing it down, and then having them teach it back to you. Well, I sucked at the coffee experiment, but what I didn't suck at is getting you back on the podcast. So, Terry, we are so happy to have you back. Thank you so much. And we're here to discuss the topic of twang, which has been a primary part of your research and something which you recently discussed for us over on our Level 5 qualification. So thank you so much for that video. It was awesome. To start with, what are we referring to when we're actually talking about twang? That's a good question. The word twang appeared in vocal pedagogy literature as early as the 1920s. There, I have found uh, references to it in vocal ped research in the 1920s. There may have even been earlier research. At some point, we may unearth something else. but but at this stage, it was in the 1920s. The, the entomology of the word is that twang is a sound that resembles a, a plucked string on a, 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 or a, on a stringed instrument. So something perhaps like a, a banjo or something that has a bright, brassy sound. And that early pedagogical research was often focused on a sound that sounded somewhat nasal to the listener's ear was bright and piercing. And often they said it was the sound that Americans made, which I kind of get a little ruffled when I read <laughs> that because I, I don't think we're all twangy. But for some reason, that was something that, that kind of appeared in the literature as an, an American twang. And, you know, later on, I think the term, again, this was something that Venard talked about. It was something that appeared in most pedagogical research books or most pedagogy textbooks. But Joe Estill came along in the 1980s and probably really popularized the term again in terms of applica applications to singing. And, and her definition of the tone was that it was a bright, brassy sound or bright piercing sound like that resembled the cackling of a witch. And I think that's the sound that, that we tend to think of when we think of twang. What was it that 
really intrigued you the most about Twang for it to become a primary part of your research? I think I stumbled into it kind of accidentally. And I think sometimes that's the best research because, you know, we, if you force a project, I, I think often it doesn't have the legs that you want it to have. I think sometimes the best research is the thing that kind of comes to your feet naturally. And in my case, I was in the clinic scoping people all the time. I, I've done about 20,000 endoscopes in my career. And one of the things we started doing was we started looking at Twang in its applications for people with weak voices, vocal fold paralysis, things like that. And so we were asking patients to twang to see if they were stimulable for mm -hmm. producing the sound, to see if it actually helped them achieve better glottic closure. And when I was scoping people, I was not seeing what I was supposed to see. And by that, I mean, I was not consistently seeing areopiglottic narrowing or narrowing of the epilarynx. And, and so I just naturally began to say, is this accurate? Is this even how we twang? And so that really kind of launched this progress, progression of research that sent me on a, I don't know, gosh, at this point, it's probably a 15-year journey or something looking at twang. In the pedagogy research and textbooks that we might come across, are there other terminologies that refer to twang? I think we sometimes hear the word brightness, adding brightness to a sound, adding squealo, adding, yeah, something, something along those lines. Sometimes people will actually ask for nasality. And I know they mean nasality. You know, they may not, they don't mean that they want us to forward focus. I think a lot of times people talk about feeling a forward focus. And certainly when we're twanging, we kind of get this perception of, of the sound being in the front of the face or in the mask. So I think all of those terms probably are hinting at elements of twang. What about something like oral twang? So twang, actually, we know can be produced with a lowered velum or with a raised velum. And if we produce twang with a, a raised velum, yeah, 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 we get no change when we pinch the nostrils. And if we lower the velum, yeah, 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 we get uh, a little change and a, a l slightly different timbre. So twang actually can be produced either nasal or oral, and we lose a little sound energy when we lower the velum. So it's not quite as bright, not quite as, as loud as it is when we have our raised velum. So if someone says, can you make your twang more oral, what they're really meaning is, can you take it out the nose? That's right. Can you lift your soft palate and can you make it so that it's not losing that sound energy as it travels through your nose. You know, your nose is a, a filter. It filters the air you breathe, and it also filters the sound that comes through it. And by filter, I mean it's as if you're singing through a cloth. You mm know, -hmm. if we sort of had a cloth over our face, it would muffle the sound a little bit, and that's what happens when we lower our velum. Anatomically speaking, what sort of structures of the vocal tract are primary here and what options do we have for creating a perceived twang sound? So really, and this depends, I suppose, on how you were trained to perceive twang, but we did do a perception study at Ohio State University looking at what conditions people perceive as twang. And uh, people primarily perceive twang when we have narrowed pharyngeal walls and or what I call lateral to medial narrowing of the pharynx. And, and that also concurrently results in a higher larynx position, although we were not specifically testing larynx position. It, those two things occur hand in hand because the pharyngeal constrictors that narrow the pharynx wrap around the throat. And they actually attach uh, to the hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage. And so when they contract, they kind of contract like this and they raise the larynx sort of up and back in the pharynx. So it's, it's really impossible to narrow the pharynx without also concurrently raising the larynx. And so you'll get some laryngeal lift the more you narrow 
the more the larynx lifts. So, you know, if I really, really, really narrow, I'm going to concurrently get a really high lift of my larynx. If I narrow only a little bit, my larynx is not going to be quite as high. And if I narrow just a smidge, my larynx can be a little bit more toward the neutral position. But what it cannot be is in a super low position because that then will um, eliminate that pharyngeal um, lateral to medial narrowing of those pharyngeal constrictors. So if, you know, some people uh, perceive anything bright as twang, and not all brightnesses are produced in the same way. So, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing. We can add brightness by pulling the tongue back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this results in a kind of a meaty brightness that our listeners actually don't perceive as twang. Mm -hmm. But perhaps you do. Perhaps that is your version of twang. And so I'm advocating that, that these are really perceptually distinct sounds and that that's a brightness that's not as bright. That brightness is a little different. It sounds a little deeper, a little more resonant. Our listeners actually perceive that as ring, mm. which is a kind of a different kind of sound. So what's the, what's the difference between lateral narrowing and front to back? narrowing and is there a situation where one would trump the other one so often in singing we're not aware that we're shaping the pharynx for these various configurations you know these things are often happening just with emotional intention mm -hmm. because we're singing or kind of how we like to express ourselves but we shape the pharynx and in fact we really need narrowing in the vocal tract somewhere to create kind of resonance uh, a resonant sound and to create a boost in spectral energy somewhere. And so we've got options how we narrow the pharynx. We can narrow using these pharyngeal constrictors that kind of wrap around. The pharyngeal constrictors start at the level of the nose, and they sort of wrap around. There are three of them, and they actually give our throat its rounded shape. And when we swallow, they constrict, they narrow, they do exactly what their name says, and that helps push the bolus or the food ball down into the pharynx. We can use those same muscles to narrow from lateral to medial. And as I said, we get a concurrent lift of the pharynx. And that gives us this really bright kind of sound like this. We can also narrow the pharynx from front to back using the back of the tongue. And this option is called APN. And when we, and I call it APN, because we're narrowing from anterior to posterior or from front to back in the pharynx, as opposed to that lateral medial narrowing of the constrictors. With APN, we're actually controlling the back third of the tongue separately from the front two thirds. And this kind of is a mind blowing concept. And I think it's very hard for singers to imagine this because we haven't had a lot of teaching on the tongue. We haven't had the teaching that we've had has been that the tongue is bad, it needs to be annihilated, right? It needs to be, you know, driven from the earth. It's an evil thing. But I think we think that because we don't understand it well enough. And so, you know, our instincts are to kind of run from things that, that are not super clear, to kind of be afraid of things that are not super clear. And so we've done what we've known to do, which is just to try to relax it, release it, you know, all these things. But in actuality, the tongue is just this marvelous structure. And the front two-thirds of the tongue can behave sort of independently from the back third of the tongue. And the reason is because, and I, I don't have a, a great model here to show you, but we basically have muscles going in all different directions. We have these posterior muscles that kind of go up and back into soft palate to the, to, to the temporal bone. And then we have these muscles in the back that go down to the hyoid bone. Those muscles pull the tongue back in some direction. They can pull it back and up. They can pull it back and down. Those muscles are meant to act independently from the front because when you swallow, you kind of bite down on the front of your tongue and you stabilize it, and then the back pushes your food backwards. 
And in this case, the tongue can actually move in opposite directions. So literally, you can stick your tongue out and still swallow and pull the back of the tongue back. It's really this remarkable thing. And what this does is it actually pressurizes the swallow enough. It pressurizes the oral and pharyngeal cavities to push that food bowl down, working with those pharyngeal constrictors, the miraculous uh, structure. But as singers, we can tap into this kind of independence of movement, and we do it all the time. So when we're singing, we, we can sort of stabilize in the front. E-I-U, E-I-U, and now I can pull back. E-I-U, you are the sunlight of my life. And it gives us a lot of this kind of soulful, resonant, ringy sound that, that really shapes a little differently. So I sort of feel like anytime I use the word soul, I'm probably using some anterior to posterior narrowing of my tongue to help shape that pharynx. We run into problems when we over APN or when we over LMN. You know, this is when we go, ooh, most of us don't sing in extreme muscular contractions. You know, most of us don't. You are the sunshine of my life. <laughs> right? It's too much APN. Most of us wouldn't like that. There are certainly examples of that, but we're often working in more subtle ways with sort of slight contractions of these muscle groups. Does that call for a change or a reframe in how we think about, and I'm doing air buddies here, tongue tension then? But is, is there a way that we maybe would be better off calling it, ah, we, t we are see hearing some APN there instead of saying your tongue is getting tense? Exactly. Yes. And I've been saying this for the last couple of years. Please, let's, let's, stop, let's stop pathologizing people. We are literally labeling people as having tension when they probably just have a placement issue with their muscles. You know, they're probably just over APNing or, or perhaps they're also pulling the tip back. I, I think about, you know, I often think back to I played on the golf team in high school. And I took some golf lessons and, you know, I can remember somebody working on my hand position on my club and uh, or my physical stance, moving my feet a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, they would have never said you have tension because your hands are in the wrong location. Yeah, that's true. They might have said loosen your grip, you know, or or move your hands apart, but they wouldn't have pathologized me. Because I think the word tension really gets in, in our singers' heads and they start to go home and say, what's wrong with my life? Why, why do I have all this tension? It may not be a problem in your life, right? I mean, let's not, let's not give people problems they may or may not have. So I, I just prefer to say something like, you know, you're pulling your tongue back pretty far. Let's see if we can reduce that. Let me show you what that feels like. So you know, if you if you have a lot of push here under the chair, and and we don't want that. Let's say sometimes we do want it. If we're doing cartoon voices, we may want that amount of APN. But often, just directing directing people to, oh, okay. So I want to see now if I can sing the scale with less of that. Um, I want to see now if I can reduce APN. A lot of times, just demonstrating. This is what it sounds like if I'm extreme. This is what a more moderate amount sounds like. This is what none sounds like. My vocal tract's very open now. E -I -U -E -I -U -E -I -E. Right, so I can demonstrate that. A lot of times the light bulbs go on and I haven't had to, I haven't had to give them an, a pathology. This is a really cannibalistic question. But have you ever eaten tongue before? Not human tongue. It's funny you ask that because I was just at the meat market this weekend. I made vegetable soup and I bought some nice soup. I went to the butcher to buy some bones to make broth, homemade broth. And, and I looked at a tongue and I just cannot imagine doing that. <laughs> I, said, no, I have not ever eaten a tongue. First of all, they're massive, you know. And but I always appreciate how massive these structures are now given they're from a cow. But but our own tongues are massive. They take up a lot of geography yeah. in the vocal tract. 
And so, like I said, you know, our, our training has really been too limited about how to use this massively important structure. I ate tongue once. I don't know what animal it was, but it was the most bizarre thing ever. I didn't know whether I'd bitten some of my own tongue off along with it because it was the same sort of texture. And I vowed never again. It was yeah. very odd. Yeah, I understand it's quite odd and a very different texture from other forms of meat. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't, re I wouldn't recommend. Yeah, I just don't think I can do that. <laughs> I'm just pressing the pause button on the podcast for a very brief moment to invite you to book your free BAST call. If you've been thinking about joining the BAST community through one of our courses, but you just don't know which option is the best for you, then why not book your free Zoom chat with our very own Kimberly George, who has all the answers. Head over to basttraining.com forward slash book a call forward slash and click that big blue button. That's basttraining.com forward slash book a call forward slash. Now, where were we? You mentioned that about the pharyngeal constrictors um, there. And I just want to ask about pitch, because if we are using twang in a sense across pitch and the pharyngeal constrictors are narrowing, or there's a narrowing anyway, as we ascend in pitch, what might we have to consider as we ascend in pitch with twang? So it's very easy to overdo twang in the upper range because twang naturally lives in the upper range because when we go up the scale, the pharyngeal walls naturally begin to narrow. It's part of pitch raising and it's not well understood. It's not well researched, but your high pitches do not happen without some lateral medial narrowing. And this always surprises singers in the clinic. They think they're tightening or constricting. In fact, a lot of doctors misinterpret this. A lot of doctors will look at that and say, oh, that's muscle tension. No, that's normal behavior. We've got a lot of teaching that needs to happen both with our laryngologists and our ENTs and about what is normal. So we, you know, we, we used to call it pharyngeal squeeze, which is probably not the best word, but, but, you know, we'd say, oh, we got to check for pharyngeal squeeze. So we, and we knew our doctors knew what that means is we're going to have them pitch glidey yes. and make sure that we see almost touching of the lateral walls of the pharynx because at the very, very top of the scale, they sometimes do what I call a high five. You know, it's like they're Woo high five in the middle of the pharynx because they, they are so narrow at the very top of the range that sometimes they touch. Wow. So as we're going up, sorry, I've got sidetracked there, but as we're going up the scale, we're already narrowing. So there is a little bit of natural twang in the voice as we go higher. That's why matching timbre across range is so challenging. We don't have the same acoustic space across the range. We have a changing landscape in the pharynx as we go up the scale. And we have to, we have to perhaps add some narrowings down low to match that timbre at the top. But it's really easy to over twang at the top, to over narrow too soon. So I think if anything, a lot of times we are thinking about perhaps widening that space a little bit. You know, as we go up, we really can't widen it. As I said, we are narrowing naturally. But by kind of imagining a more spacious production, we can sometimes prevent ourselves from over narrowing too soon in the production. What would be the symptoms for the, the singer potentially and the vocal coach for somebody who is potentially over twanging? So I, you know, as I mentioned, one of the things I'll sometimes work on is larynx height because it feels a little more accessible to the student than reduce your pharyngeal constrictors. <laughs> At least with larynx height, you can feel the larynx on the front of the neck. You can monitor that. So a lot of times I'll tell my students, okay, yeah, this is a really small, you've got a lot of LMN and a really high larynx. Because as I said, when we narrow the uh, pharyngeal constrictors, the larynx naturally comes up. The more we narrow, the more it comes up. So if we've got this like really tiny space, then a lot of times I just work on adding a little more space or adding a little more space here. So I have my singers kind of feel like they're <laughs> lengthening this way, which will naturally help reduce the LMN. 
And so you can work at it from a twang perspective. How much narrowing? Or you can work at it from a length perspective. And both of them will help you find the right amount. The other thing that I think is really important for singing teachers is to start quiet. So if I was working on a song that might over twang, like something like, Till someone gets hurt from Mean Girls or something, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 till someone gets hurt. I can tell that's going to be way too twangy. When I add volume to that, it's never going to be right. It's going to be too twangy. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say, Till someone, till someone, till someone gets hurt. Now, if I lower too much, Till someone get, now I've lost my twang totally. And it's too wolfy. So I find finding the shape that you want in your pharynx in a quiet voice is such an, a great way to sort of go, is my pharynx right? Then I can go back and I can add volume to that. Once I've got it, the Goldilocks version, right? The version mm-hmm. I'm really happy with. I can then go back and and play with adding in some volume. And you're demonstrating something that's really popular at the moment, Mean Girls, and that's a real belter in a show. So what benefits can twang actually give us? So assisting belt, I'm assuming there with your example, what else can it give us and and how does it assist belt? So it's it's a Two-edged sword, I suppose, because while it can be really helpful to belt and adding that high-frequency energy, twang adds energy above 4,500, 5,000, somewhere in that vicinity, depending on the shape of your vocal tract. But it and, and those frequencies above that have a real kind of crickety edge to them. And so it's a very buzzy, cricket-like quality. So our ears really respond to that kind of piercing, edgy sound. And that is part of the twang or part of the belt recipe, that we kind of expect that edge on the voice. When the vocal tract is really open, it gives us warmth and depth of sound. And those, those are very different qualities that, that we don't associate with belt. So we need a little bit of, a little bit of twang. However, twang can also result in a system that is overly pressurized, particularly if there is too much narrowing. There seems to be a synchrony with lateral medial narrowing and the tendency to push or constrict. And I often see this if people are over elementing and overly thick vocal folds. Those two things don't pair real well together. And I, I sometimes just tell my students, it feels like we need a pressure release valve. Like there's, like we're too narrow and we have really thick vocal folds. And literally, it feels like the system is overly pressurized. And so actually, ironically, when we are belting and using LMN as our brightening strategy, I don't think our vocal folds are as thick as we think they are, top of the range. And particularly above you know, C5. I don't think we're in mega thick vocal folds. And so this is, this is the disconnect that I sometimes see when people are straining, they're overly thick, too high, and they're overly elementing. And so one of those things has to give at least one of those things. And often I think it's the vocal fold mass. I think we've trained ourselves to think that we stay in an M2 and we, or an M1, sorry, M1, and we push that M1 as high as we can, and we don't allow some thinning of vocal fold mass as we ascend in range. We really need to. Yeah, I love that as well, because the work of Amanda Flynn recently talking about how we want to maintain the perception of it being somewhat thicker and stronger, but allowing the lightness to take over, because that is what is happening as we ascend in pitch, the vocal folds do have to thin out. So that is what it's still going to have to do when we're belting. It's a complex system that we try to overly uh, uh, simplify. And I find that I have different breath strategies. So when my vocal fold mass is a little thinner, I actually can increase subglottic pressure, take a bigger breath and hold it under the vocal folds Mm -hmm. and, and create an additional kind of element of maintaining adduction. 
but I don't think it's abduction along its depth. And so I, th- I think, you know, it's a complex system. I think we have different breath strategies depending on our recipe choices. And, and I think, like I said, those, those thin vocal folds, if we don't add some subglottic pressure, can feel overly thin. Likewise, if we have really thick vocal fold mass, too much subglottic pressure, it can feel strained. So it, it's a dynamic system that requires a lot of uh, fluidity with the singer. For people who are working as voice actors, I'm thinking of those who voice Lisa Simpson and Lois Grissin from Family Guy, even actors who are playing roles like Adelaide in Guys and Dolls and The Orphan Annie. They are potentially calling upon a, a variation of twang quite a lot to create these sounds. What is the potential complication of using twang a lot. And is there something you encourage singers to do if they have to call upon this quality quite regularly? Actually, I think a lot of those cartoon characters are using APN. Mm-hmm. They're using these kinds of sounds. Oh my gosh. Now sometimes, sometimes we add a little element of that LMN plus APN, but often they're in their speech range. And so even if they're having some dynamic pitch changes, you know, they're still within a range of pitches that one would call speech range. And we don't tend to run into problems in our speech range. We tend to run into problems when we sort of go past, you know, into that upper octave of voice or into the lowest octaves of our voice. But in, in in that sort of middle range of the voice, we don't tend to run into as much problems. It's, it's once we've crossed that sort of second passaggio region, that, that we start running into issues because of the amount of pharyngeal narrowing. Um, and like I said, if we pair that with an overly thick vocal fold, we're going to be in trouble. But again, a lot of these voiceover folks are working with microphones. They're not in super thick vocal folds. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're sort of like, in, it's, there's only not you like this or even like this. And they're, you know, I'm certainly not in like any really thick vocal fold mass. I'm just adding some LMN. And so in, the, in those thinner vocal fold masses, we're not going to run into any problems. So would you be more encouraging of someone to have LMN more often than APN if, say, they do experience lots of tongue pulling in their general singing? Is that going to be more useful for them? Or, or would you still call upon a bit of APN? Again, APN, APN is magical if you get it right. It's necessary if you want to sing soulful, if you want to have these darker timbres, it's necessary. So I tend to say, let's, let's stick with it and work it out. Let's learn how to use it. So I don't know that it would be one or the other. But, you know, I really like all my singers to have access to all the tools. So mm-hmm. it would sort of be like teaching a singer to only paint with some colors. And, and so I, I, I like to sort of stick with it and work it out with them. But I will say that if I'm working with sopranos, a lot of times LMN is their natural brightening strategy because they're up there anyway, and that's their tessitura. So sometimes the music that you're singing sort of dictates what the choices are. I mean, if you come to me with, you know, a low-pitched Stevie Wonder song, I'm probably gonna use that APN because I probably don't want this. So I think the music sometimes makes those choices for us. I think the tessitura or the pitch range that you're in makes those choices. And, and as a singer, I think we want all of it. Does there have to be some foundational technical things in place first for twang to be available? Like, do we have to have adduction available first before we can twang? Uh, adduction naturally happens when we twang. So it has that kind of nonlinear effect, whether it's, whether it's a nonlinear acoustic effect or whether it's a physical effect, meaning narrowing somehow changes the adduction, not really known. But either way, adding LMN does tend to add adduction and so does adding APN. So I don't know. I actually think if you have a breathy singer, um, adding some LMN is a great way to help them get adduction. What about the singers who just say, oh, I really can't find it. I don't know how to get it. Um, they may be mapping incorrectly because, as I said, for a long time, people thought that twang happened in the epilarynx and, you know, that, that it was this narrowing. We see epilaryngeal narrowing 
all the time, and it doesn't correlate always with twang. And, and this is really hard for people to understand. And the first thing that happens whenever I tell people it's not AES, mm -hmm. not the area of the glenic sphincter, they always send me a video of themselves twanging with AES narrowing. And, and I, was, I was thinking about it, you know, in fact, I think I'm going to make a little video about it this week. You know, if I did not know, I made my vegetable soup this weekend. It's a two-day process. I love doing it because it's, it's a slow kind of intentional thing. It's, you know, you make your broth and sits overnight. You strain the fat and then, you know, it's a long process. It's a beautiful thing to make a soup. But I was thinking, if I didn't know what added garlic to the recipe, I might look in and go, wow, there's carrots in there. A lot of carrots. It must be the carrots. We all know that observation is not correlation. So we cannot say, when I'm twanging, look, my area of the sphincter is narrowed. Because I can tell you that about, I, I would say it's very high, like 70 or 80% of the people who twang don't have area of narrowing. It's not consistent. And also, we see area, area of narrowing under other circumstances when we don't hear twang. For example, we see it when we say, ah, the tongue pushes back, the area of the glottic sphincter epiglottis pushes back, we get a narrowed epilarynx, we don't hear twang. If that's an acoustic space, it should create the same acoustic effect every time. And it does not. However, the pharyngeal narrowing creates the same acoustic effect every time. And so this is a really hard thing. We've kind of been doing our research a little bit backward. Let me twang and see what I see. We get carrots, right? We get carrots and think that that's garlic. And that's not. So I think this is, like I said, something that is quite hard. So people may be mapping incorrectly. They may be mapping too low. Mm -hmm. They may be thinking twang occurs down here when actually it feels much higher in the pharynx. So I think that's a that's a way to think about it. I think doing playful things like kitten meows, mm -hmm. barnyard animals, bah, bah. There's a funny story. A friend of mine was teaching somewhere and he said he couldn't get this person to twang. You know, he said, come on, make it nasty. Okay. And they were like, it, they just couldn't, couldn't get it. And he finally said, when you were a kid, who was the meanest person on the playground? And this person said, Zowie. <laughs> you know? And so anyway, you know, I think sometimes it's, it's sort of tapping into childhood. It's being playful. It's finding a barnyard animal that will help that person find it. Start high pitched also because we're naturally elementing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Keep that sensation that you're feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think a lot of times those hand gestures can be helpful. Yeah. Telling them where they've lost it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they can begin to feel and and make some of those connections. I know you mentioned in the beginning the kind of salty feelings that you might get when someone says it's an American twang, but are there some like regional accents that may be useful to play into this kind of twang exploration as well? For sure. We, you know, we do have regions that in the U.S. where people have a bit more twang and naturally. I, th I think about New York, N New Jersey, you know, the Long Island psychic, you know, she's on a dog like this. And so absolutely, there are regions of the U.S. where we hear a little bit more of that LMN. Naturally, you probably have it, you know, in the U.K., I was thinking about maybe maybe your auctioneers at, at the sh selling their sheep or something might be, might have more LMN. Certain regions of the U.K. might have more LMN. I'm sure every part of the world has its regions where where you can sort of relate to this idea. But yes, I, th I think when they talk about an American twang, they're talking about a very specific pocket, probably in the Northeastern United States, where we hear a little bit more of that, because certainly in the, you know, there are parts of the Deep South where this is more the, the, the dialect, which is very much open vocal tract. 
And so I, I think it, it's not fair to say that the whole of America uh, sounds like this. We've blanketed you. <laughs> yes, yes. You've talked about the fact that it isn't AES that's happening in Twang. What other myth would you like to bust about Twang? I'd also like to bust the myth that you can lower your larynx with it. Right? Because if you, if you go below that sort of neutral larynx for that pitch, you, you won't have, you won't have LMN. So if you're able to lower your larynx and keep your brightness, you're probably using APN. You're probably not LMNing because APN is not limited in terms of larynx height, but LMN is a little bit limited. We can only go so low and then it pulls the contraction out. And so, the, you know, there was this exercise that we used to do in, in a particular method that I taught for many years. I don't want to, I don't want to be unkind to the method because it has many useful things. But one of the exercises was called a seven part figure and where you practice. And the last step was you, you kind of created all this brightness in the sound and all this energy. And the last step was to drop the larynx. And what I found was about half the people who would come to demonstrate their ability to do this this particular exercise when they drop the larynx they would drop the larynx so low they would really lose the opera quality mm. they would really lose the brightness in the voice and it wasn't clear why well all these years later i now understand that particular methodology was ascribing all brightness to one sound twang all brightness was ascribed to Aryepiglottic narrowing, it was all considered to be twang, when in fact, people who were doing that exercise, some of them were using APN and able to navigate that low larynx position. Many of them, particularly sopranos, were using LMN. And when the soprano would try to do that final step and they would lower their larynx, they would lose their brightening strategy because they were mm -hmm. LMNing. So I would say that's the other myth that you can lower your larynx with LMN, you cannot. So if you're able to maintain brightness, you're probably an APNer. A lot of us will want to continue looking into this topic. Have, have you got any resources that you'd like to share with us about twanging? Sure, I'd love to. I've got a website called getvocal-now.com. So the emphasis is on why wait when you can do it now, getvocal-now.com. And I do have some courses there. I've got an extended course on finding your signature sound that I've recently posted. I'm, I'm getting ready in the next few days to post a course on VLM control. This is an area, another myth-busting area, I think, that requires some. And so I'd love for people to join there. And it's not a membership. It's, a, it's an a la carte, purchase what you want website. Those are downloadable resources, and you can watch those videos and on your own time and and get that information. Amazing. And in the future, Kerry, what sort of videos and things would you like to explore further? So the next research project, we were going to do this last summer, and unfortunately, we didn't have ethic approval yet. It's complex when you work through hospital systems to get ethics approval, and often you have to have ethics approval at the university where you teach, plus the hospital has to approve. If you're working through the NHS, you know, you sometimes have to have approvals in place there. But the next project I really want to do is I want to look at what, at what point those pharyngeal constrictors narrow in the range and to see how that relates to our perception of passaggio. And because absolutely it narrows in the range for all of us. And I want to see if that perhaps is a correlating feature to that second passaggio region. And do we all narrow at the same place? Do we all narrow the same amount? Do we all narrow might that relate to pitch? And, and is it different by voice type? Is it different if we're loud or soft? I did a preliminary study on this a long time ago, but I was just at the beginning of understanding how all this works. So I'd like to go back and, and look at this again. As a researcher, and therefore thinking about how this then translates to the vocal coach, how do you personally deal with finding something out that you thought was different to start with and, and kind of how you don't get frustrated with the system or kind of forgive yourself for teaching it one way when now you know another way. I certainly had to deal with that because I taught that area epiglottic sphincter narrowing 
produce twang. I taught that for 20 years, you know, or more. And, uh, and I was an absolute advocate of that. And so I think it's just acknowledging, well, we used to think this and now we think this and, um, and, and just say it, move along. Um, I think it actually gives you credibility to be able to acknowledge that, that you think differently about something and, and why you think differently. And certainly you can point to advancements in research. And as a teacher, you can say, you know, they used to think it was this. Now, one thing that's really great, a lot of the strategies that we used when we thought it was the area of a glut extinctor still work. So you may not have been, you know, it's not like you were messing up lots of singers by your teaching. Your teaching probably was still resulting in great technique. Um, It's just you've got a little more specific label now for it. You've got a little better, perhaps, mapping that you can give students. Um, but I think acknowledging it and just moving on, being okay with the fact that we, you know, knowledge changes. So true. Thank you, Kerry, so much. Where can we keep following your work and and get in touch with you? So the Get Vocal Now is my educational platform. I also, you can find me at obertvoicestudios.com. I've, I've got contact information there. So if you'd like to get in touch, feel free to do that. I'd love to hear from you. Great. And I won't leave this podcast promising any new seats that I'd be going on to change my taste buds. I'll leave that one this time. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.